O'Leary. And we have a very, very special guest, Howard Keener. Howard uh, was a friend of uh, Apo Iyong in Stockton. And as we know, Stockton was pretty much the center of the Filipino community and a large organize, a base of organizing, union organizing in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Okay. And myself, I'm Mary Jane Galviso. I'm with uh, Ilocano Farms. That's my farm down in Tulare County. And as I say on my little petition, we are the very last remaining Filipino farming community in this country. After World War II, there were a number of Filipino farming communities. Uh, we were in, in Imperial Valley, in Santa Maria, in Yolo County, in Stockton. There were a lot of Filipino farmers, and we were very prosperous. We became very prosperous farmers. But by the 60s, Big Ag had totally ruined us. Without exception, almost every Filipino farmer lost their farm. And we were turned back into migrant farmers just at the time the 1965 strike was launched. Kind of a twist in history how agribusiness uh, <laughs> dictates what's happening in this economy. But uh, so we're going to, uh, this is not a, uh, this is basically a presentation to kind of stimulate the, the discussion on two levels. First, it's a recognition of the role Filipinos play in the development of agriculture in this country, of agribusiness as to what it is. Without Filipinos on the plantations in the Hawaii and the canneries in Alaska and in the fields and the orchards throughout the West Coast from Washington to California to Arizona, there would not be agribusiness as we knew it. We allow those small, those farmers, mostly Italian, to become corporate farmers. And from corporate farmers, they could become, now, uh, they could um, go outside the borders, they could trans, uh, become bigger corporate farmers. And um, in Hawaii, of course, in Yodo and back in the rest. They later jumped out of Hawaii and are now in Vietnam, the Philippines, Thailand, Costa Rica. And so agriculture in this country is a huge and powerful um, uh, corporate entity. They're, they're huge. And if you really want to know a little bit more about it, you can read about how they boast in uh, the San Joaquin Valley on the amount of money and where their exports go dairy products to the Philippines, to Mexico, beef to Mexico. So anyway, if you want to know a little bit about agricultural commodities in this country. But, uh, so Howard's going to speak on his role, I'll speak a little, too much, and Johnny of course, okay? So who'd like to begin, and of course, please, any questions or comments, we welcome those. <laughs> well, I have to transfer files to take a look at Okay, I'm 88 years old and I might collapse before the end, so I better start. Um, Did you use the mic? I really don't like I really don't like using the mic. Sorry. This issue is very close to my heart. My father was an <coughs> agricultural worker. His father was an agricultural worker. His grandfather was an agricultural worker. And I married a young Filipino woman whose his family had migrated from uh, Cebu to Hawaii and then later to California where they were farm workers. So the issue was close to my heart. Um, in 1949, well, I, I actually moved to start in 1946. Uh, and uh, I had never met any Filipinos. Suddenly I had been in the middle of the largest Filipino community in the 48th at the uh, continental United States. But anyway. Where were you from that you never met any Appalachia. Oh. I'm a hillbilly. It's a slightly proletarianized hillbilly. But at any rate, um, uh, when I moved to Stockton in 1946, I was shocked to discover it was one of the most racist cities in the United States. Uh, and the racism against 
the libido is worse than it was even among black people in Stockton. That's hard to conceptualize, but it's true. Quite shocking. I, I won't go into that. That's not part of the part of the story. But in 1949, I became involved with the strike of 7,000 Filipino asparagus cutters in the Stockton Delta area. Uh, one has to remember that if, if you don't, the Filipinos were the most skilled part, uh, agricultural workers in California and in Hawaii. Highly skilled. There was some skills that no one else could do. For example, cutting white asparagus. After the Filipinos all left the fields in the Delta area, there was no more white asparagus on the market. Nobody else could cut it. Um, <clears throat> at any rate, 1949, 7,000 Filipino asparagus players in Stockton went on strike. Um, the strike was lost, but it was a long, bitter strike. They had them, the growers recruited large numbers of scabs who lived in barracks out, out of the Delta on, on, the, on the farm, on the ranches. There was no way to get to them. The uh, you know, sheriff's deputies protected the areas so that all we could, all we could do was picketing on the outskirts. But one of the things that happened in that strike, which hardly anybody remembers, but I have to remind you, the Filipino agricultural workers were not pacifists. One <laughs> Filipino uh, member of the union had a pilot's license. He rented a plane and he went up and he buzzed the fields and drove the scabs out of the fields for one day until they kind of mobilized the civil air patrol and drove him back on the ground and took him to jail. It was Ted and Chen. At any rate, I, quit, I was going to college at the time, and I quit college to work with the union. I helped out mostly with uh, helping to organize the pickets and to helping to organize the, uh, uh, the soup kitchen. By the way, the, the diet of the soup kitchen wasn't very varied. It was mostly rice and chicken legs. <clears throat> I haven't eaten chicken legs since. <laughs> anyway, during the strike, the growers refused to agree with the union at all. They say we will only talk to the Filipino fraternal organizations, who, by the, by the way, did not want to talk to them. They said, go talk to the union. Uh, because the adult Filipino fraternal organizations, with one single exception, supported the, the striking Filipino asparagus cutters. The exception was <coughs> the um, Filipino Federation of America, whose leader told their people that you can't strike against the asparagus because the asparagus belongs to God. So, so the, the members of the Filipino Federation of America struck during the strike. One of the other things that happened, <clears throat> and I have to go back here and explain something, it's called, it was called the Pando, or the holdback. When the uh, asparagus cutters went to work, and they went to work as teams, uh, they had to sign a contract which allowed the uh, grower to hold back one-third of their wages until the end of the season. If they went on strike or quit, they forwarded one-third of their wages. Strictly illegal. By the way, during the strike, the union took the issue to court, and of course, the courts upheld the pot uh, <clears throat> The During this strike, I, I got to know all the main, major leaders of the union. I had a special in. Uh, a comment of mine the Communist Party and done a lot of organizing of the farm workers in the Central Valley in 1930 was on site back to Agostino. And she introduced me to all the activists and leaders of the union. The union was local seven <coughs> moved to back to agricultural workers, um, which conducted a strike. There was the Alaskeros, the Filipinos who went to Alaska to work with the salmon candidates during that period. At any rate, I met Carlos Bulosan, Chris Gonzalez, Ernie McGowan, and of course, Larry Hill. I got to know them quite well, especially Larry. Uh, not much has been written about that strike, by the way, except that Pete Dela Cruz's uh, one chapter of his memoirs. But Pete had just started 
In fact, that was the first year you could ever join, the first strike you could ever So he was kind of you know, a, newbie, a new boy on the block. So I, but I had an unusual opportunity to get to know all the leaders of the union, the activists. And what I learned was, which I didn't know at the time, that almost all of the, <coughs> all of the leaders, activists, trade union leaders of Philadelphia, like cultural workers, either not members of the Communist Party or former members of close to it. The main ideology among, uh, there was a political ideology among the uh, you know, agricultural workers um, was, uh, was, was the communist ideology. People don't like to hear that, but it's true. <clears throat> so there's also the, uh, 1949 was the, uh, well into the witch hunts. So there was an atmosphere of a um, great deal of red baiting against the union because the union, the FT, the uh, <clears throat> Food, Tobacco, and Agricultural Workers Union, their main union, had been expelled from the CIO uh, in 1948. And the union was in the process of coming under attacks and disappearing in the next year. Uh, to give you, <coughs> give you a flavor of what it was like, uh, who remembers uh, Clero Candelario? Uh, Carlos Pelosa mentions him by name, Clero, uh, extensively in his, in his book. Americans in the heart. Clara was his mentor. And everyone knew that was Clara Contrario. And Clara told me, he says, I wish Carlos had not been so explicit about our communist activities because it's coming down on us pretty heavy now. Um, later on, <clears throat> well, one of the things that also is characteristic of the Philippine agricultural workers is that they worked as a team. Uh, asparagus, for example, the entire team would sign a contract. And all the earnings uh, from the team went into a pot that was evenly divided. And one member of the team, usually someone who had some physical problems or disability, was assigned to do the cooking and laundry and some other stuff. But these workers all had a very, very, they came out of the barrios in the locals and the desires. And they had a very communal sense, a very strong sense of solidarity. I <clears throat> spent my life as a member of trade unionists. I worked with trade unionists, many different ethnic groups. And the best trade unionists I ever worked with were these Filipinos, for the barrios. <clears throat> About, uh, they had an extraordinary sense of solidarity something that uh, could well be emulated today. Later on, I went to work, I helped out some with the AFL-CIO, agricultural <coughs> attempt to organize farm workers in the Stockton area, which was a, a, pretty much a failed experiment. I did some ancillary work with the, with the United farm, farm Workers. When the Filipinos joined up with Cesar Chavez for the United Farm workers, I knew that there would be problems or tensions because the Filipinos were not pacifists and, and they believed in military trade unionism. And I knew that there would be problems, I knew there would be tensions. In fact, I was, I was surprised that uh, the alliance lasted as long as it did, and not too surprised that the Filipinos were largely marginalized and forced out of uh, the union. Um, When the uh, agricultural corporations sent recruiters to the Philippines to recruit uh, young men to come to uh, California in the late 20s, early 30s, they went to the barrios. They assumed that if they got not too well educated young men, brought them over, made sure that no Filipino women could immigrate to the U.S., and that's another story. Uh, they would have a tame, skilled, migratory workforce. They, they miscalculated. They didn't understand that these would become some of the most militant workers in the history of the working class movement in the United States. Okay, that's enough for now.
<laughs> more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
He was very militant in his ways, uh, very leftist in thinking and, and collective bargaining rights and as far as uh, the working man goes. Because without those collective bargaining rights, it's how do you bargain with the, the uh, huge uh, uh, corporations you know, that, that be? And uh, I wanted to read something here that I found last night while I was looking at some of the stuff. Um, and this was at a, uh, uh, with a one conference. This is a, a, a condensation of speech by Larry Gitlian, former president of the Filipino community of Stockton. We must learn to have complete understanding and to work together. In the past years, we have learned that if people do not have an understanding of what a strike is about, you will not have a union. Let us see to it that we stick together. We must pay our dues. I know we here at this conference understand, but we must make others understand also. This is our job, to educate others. If we set our hearts to this job, then through our willingness, understanding, and efforts, we will succeed. And how true, more true, could that be? And that was one thing that I really understood, that my father, he knew how to really organize and get people to work together and bring people together. And um, through myself doing this, uh, I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, mostly that I, I'm not my father in that sense. So it's, been, it's been hard, you know, uh, getting doing some of these, these events and stuff. And, and I, I'm not, uh, I, I speak from the heart. I've tried many times to write, to physically write speech, but I just speak from the heart. And many times I'll forget uh, about you know certain times or events, and this is why I I show these these slideshows. And, and many of you have seen uh, been to some other events that I've been at, and this is what I do. And so you can get a visual experience of, of what really happened. And that's myself and Albert Haas at uh, Destination Delano right. this last year. This is on my farm. And, and, yes. This is Mary Jane's farm in Tulare County, so it's backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the tree that, that uh, uh, we planted uh, in the name of Larry Gidleon. Right. And so the Filipino Farmers Cooperative will be building a, uh, creating a traditional Filipino garden around the tree. So, um, I, um, I really miss my father. He was, he was a great, great man and a great father. And it, it really touches my heart when I come to these events and I meet people like this gentleman right here and over here. And to tell me, you know, that you know they knew my father and to hear stories about him and how he changed things and how he helped and how he what kind of person he was. And he definitely uh, uh, made a mark in this world and you know because of his work uh, he he sat on the legislative board to create the uh, first agricultural uh, labor laws which in turn became uh, was the beginning of the um, workers laws and uh, so every, every working American here in the United States owes a, a debt of gratitude to him and uh, this is what you know, I'm trying to do is get people to realize who this man really was and how much of a difference that he made. And the thing is, he, he didn't care about that. He wasn't about winning awards or, or you know, getting plaques or recognition and, and stuff like that. He was about helping the people till the day he died. And uh, I remember uh, uh, reading a letter uh, that uh, Sid Belger wrote. And it said that one of the last things that Larry asked him to do was bring his people together. And uh, I've taken that mission to heart uh, to help do that and bring 
the communities together um, to really fight for, for our Filipino rights, our Filipino history, and um, our American history, because that's who we are. And that's who we need to be. And this is what we've become. You know, we've made such a key. My, uh, my good friend, uh, Mark Polito, uh, he, uh, I'm going to quote him, uh, he says that uh, uh, we stand on the shoulders of the uh, unknown generation, and that could be not more true. And, um, you know, people like Mary Jane here, too, is, has helped make that difference. And uh, uh, just really work, work towards that. And again, with the making of uh, the Delano Manon's uh, documentary uh, coming out a week after uh, the Cesar Chavez film, uh, which actually was perfect timing. Um, for those who know, um, I, or who don't know, I went and picketed the Chavez movie at the uh, opening of the Man Chinese Theater in Hollywood. <laughs> Why, why doing that? Why? Why? Um, first of all, I, I didn't see the movie prior to that because this was the first showing of it. But it was simple. The trailer to the movie showed everything that Cesar Chavez did, everything himself. He flew in from the heavens above and saved the day, basically, is, what, is how they portrayed the movie. And just by that, uh, one of the main scenes for me uh, was the sitting of, of the signing of the great contract, the 1965 uh, Daniel uh, boycott contract. If you look at that contract, uh, Larry's name is number one. Number two is Cesar Chavez. And what most people don't know, and which I just learned actually in this same room, um, was it last year? Last year. Yeah, last year. Mm -hmm. um, information that was given to all of us by uh, Sid Bellador is that the whole Delano Grape Strike, the whole thing, everything was under AWOC because uh, UFWOC uh, was not chartered until after the fact. And if you look at AFL CIO's, the actual contract, it's under AWOC. So that, that's one major thing in history that really needs to get, get told and changed. And so that, what does that make clear? It makes clear that Chavez was not the one who did it all. So that really pushed me to go out there and strike. And it was myself and uh, Eliseo Art Silva, who is one of our, our great Filipino muralists, uh, who we, we got together and the pictures that you can see, the, uh, the movie and the uh, historical pictures, uh, He's the one who put that together for me. We, we made picket signs and everything and went across the street in the line of the cameras. So whenever they shot the people walking through, you can see it straight in the background. And then after that, people were lining up to get in. I went across the street and stood in that line and passed out information to each and every person that would take it from me, which included, uh, actually, I'm sorry, which did not include the, the director she um, said, told me, because I explained to her, I was trying to explain to her that I was the son of Larry, and she didn't hear that, and um, that the movie uh, doesn't depict the historical fact. And she said, oh, no, 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 it's okay. You'll like the movie. The Filipino community will be very happy. And um, being excluded? Yes. And <laughs> uh, I, was, <laughs> I was, was far from that. So the assistant director, which was behind her, realized who I was, and they, they already went in, you know, because it was a line. And so they came back out, she personally came back out, and asked me to come see the movie, and handed me two tickets. So I took Eliseo with me, and um, talk about some people being very uncomfortable that were around me. Uh, unfortunately, it, it, it made me so angry watching the movie, I, I was throwing F-bombs left and right. And you could, it was, like I said, very, very quiet around me, because I, I was not happy. And uh, either was at a sale, and uh, and Dario Bosco, who played my my father and his brother, um, oh, I'm forgetting which one, but the older brother that was with him was sitting uh, 
across the aisle, this was in the Man Chinese Theater, and about three rows down. And he kept on looking back because he could hear me with my f bombs going. And uh, you know, and I, I could, I, and I just called it like it is. And um, so I, I actually got up and, and went out uh, right after they showed the scene of, of, uh, of <coughs> Cesar Chavez signing his name to save the world. And, uh, uh, and I just happened to catch uh, the director of. Uh, uh, basically his name, um, Diego Luna, in, in the lobby, and I grabbed him. I go, excuse me, sir, uh, you know, my name is Johnny Leon, oh, you're, you're Larry's son. He knew exactly who I was. And, uh, <laughs> and the funny thing is, I, I, took, I go, hey, can I take a picture with you? And I took the picture first before I threw <laughs> my, my fire at him. <laughs> just, just to make sure that people could not say, you didn't talk to this man. So it was more for that, that purpose. <coughs> so I, I, I threw my, my fireball and I'm like, why isn't my father sitting at the table when his name is first on that contract? And the only thing he said, well, the, what he said to me was, well, that Catholic priest is not there either. <laughs> and, yeah, okay. exactly. Well, yeah, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, and this is Hollywood. Yes. This is Hollywood. Thanks for Robert Kennedy was there. Yeah, yeah. So that that uh, you know, I just kind of like. <laughs> I even said something after after the fact, and and uh, so after the movie finished, like, I went to watch the rest of it because the LSA was still there, and uh, I wanted to speak to Darian and his brother and stuff, and, and I wanted to to confront uh, uh, Dolores Prota uh, and Arturo Rodriguez. And uh, um, you know, just talk to as many people as I could because this is what I do. I go out there and I speak, and I speak personally, and I speak face to face, and I look at their eyes and I tell them, you know, this is not the way it is. And I, I see them do their song and dance and, and try to bend things around and to make it how it is or whatever. And, and um, so I made it down to stage. I looked at Arturo Rodriguez's face. He stuck his hand out, I grabbed his hand, and I shook it, and I said, Arturo, did you see us out there picketing? And he, he just smiles and, and just shakes his head. And then I asked him, where are the rest of, of the, uh, uh, the Manones? Where, where's Pete? Where's Philip? Where's Andy? Where's Ben? Where, where, how come they weren't in there? Second question is, why did you make Larry a spectator when his name is number one on that sheet. <coughs> oh, well, we didn't have any control. What? Yeah. We didn't have any control. Oh, there's hundreds of hours of film footage that got clipped from the movie. So, okay. I just looked at him, shook my head, and, and just, okay. Went on to Dolores. Same thing, I asked her. Hey, Dolores, did you see us picking up out there? She's not as, you know. She's a little bit more frail, and, and, and um, we there was an event in in, <laughs> in San Jose for the um, uh, the mural in San Jose, and uh, she got uh, put in check by uh, uh, Fred Ross because I showed Fred, Fred Ross her bio that you type in Google and it shows her bio, and it says that Cesar Chavez and Dolores Volta founded United Farm and Christina. and I grabbed my iPhone, um, Uncle Fred. He, you know, I pulled out, you know, Googled it and showed him, I go, Uncle Fred, look, this is what is being said. And he was so angry that apparently he took her aside and, and cussed her out. And um, she came to me and, and just said hi to me and just walked off. I go, okay, I'm going to go now and just shook my hand and left. And um, so, and prior to that, at the Andy Amaton uh, Memorial, uh, she claimed that she taught Larry everything he knew about unionizing. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that? I knew Dolores Huerta in Stockton back in this period. And she was a rather minor community organizer. She didn't know shit from union organizing. And she was, and she I was a, a 20 year old when she met my dad, who was, who was already. This reading, rewriting of history drives me crazy. Yeah. So, 
<laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I can go on, but um, should we stick to this? Because I, I can tell a lot more about this coming up <laughs> to the 40th anniversary. I was going to ask if I could put my, you look you have a so um, I think I think what we're hitting on is is the is the issue of and I know on the film Delaney Manons it says the forgotten history but I think that we need to be clear whether the history was forgotten whether it was just uh, uh, you know. Um, overlooked, or as how it says, was it suppressed? And I think, that, I think that we're all clear, it's the victor who writes the history, and that is what has happened. Between the Huerta and the Chavez Foundation through the UFW, they have rewritten labor history. And they have made themselves the heroes, and in doing so, they completely take out of context the true history of agricultural labor organizing in this country. And one thing that we want to point out is this, that because Filipinos entered this country as a huge, huge labor force, a colonial labor force, that we were one of the single largest part of the agricultural labor workforce in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, at a time when there was basically white flight. I mean, the chain, the agriculture was changing in this country, right? Farmers, farms, uh, more and more people were going into the cities, into the urban areas, and the Philippines found colonial labor and tapped it to bring in. Now they brought in Puerto Ricans and others into, in, onto the plantations in Hawaii, but by and large we were the backbone of the labor force in Hawaii, in the canneries in Alaska. And we composed nearly one third of the agricultural workforce on the west coast. And um, through that, And that came, at, you know, that came at a pivotal time. Like I said, agriculture was doing its one of its first shifts during the last century, right? And that shift was going from family farms into corporate farms. But in, in the late 50s, as we know, there was a huge crash in the in, in agriculture worldwide. It was terrible. But the interesting thing about U.S. agriculture is that in that contraction it was able to survive and get and, and build itself even greater. And what it did is that it found markets outside the U.S. And so I think that what, what, what now faces the, 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 those of us who are, uh, who are in the left movement, who are in the trade union movement, is that we can't allow the UFW to put up a charade and to rewrite history. If we, if we want to have the type of working class consciousness that's necessary, we have to recapture this history and put it, and put, it, put it clearly. And um, Howard points to something that's very interesting. I think it starts with the Filipino community. And that we have to be very honest about who the Filipino leadership was. In great part, they were, very, they were leftist, they were so, socialist and communist. They were very close to the Communist Party in this country and to many of the leftist organizations. And in that way, they were able to, um, they could see that there was something beyond just the unionizing, the day-to-day -day unionizing. There was something more they were fighting for, for a better society. And that's what allowed them to keep fighting decade after decade. And what I remind people is that there is no other group in this country, there is no other people in this country but Filipinos in the agricultural sector that after decades, after being excluded from collective bargaining rights, that we continue to fight. We were the most determined. We were the most right, militant. And we fought 
decade after decade after decade to unionize agricultural workers from, from Hawaii to Alaska to the West Coast. And it came to fruition, of course, in the 1965 grave strike for California. That was our breakthrough to getting collective bargaining rights for agricultural workers. And what I just wanted to touch on very quickly was how we lost it all. How we lost it all. How that, you know, I and mean, I remind Johnny that, that his father was a brilliant strategist. He knew when to strike. He knew when to, you know, after listening to the workers, after, you know, after careful analysis, reading and studying, when was the best time? When can we hit the growers when they would most hurt and they would come to the table, right? He knew that. And so, uh, so that's what 1965 represented. And if you don't portray that, that history accurately, agricultural workers are going to be in the state that they are now. And they are without the benefit and the protection of a union. Okay. So let's go up real quick to the very first one. And what I wanted to show was this. This is in Seattle. Um, they are saying at the height of, in the 30s, right, there were Filipinos, and I mean, we're talking hundreds and thousands of Filipinos that were basically imported as cheap colonial labor to, to the west coast of this country. And uh, one of the big attractions, of course, was the, the development. We helped to the, develop the uh, seafood tanneries in Alaska in the Northwest. And, um, and so um, came, out of that came some of the most militant um, organizers. One of them, of course, was Carlos Bulasan, who we know was, was um, uh, never hid the fact that he was in the Communist Party. And he was one of the leaders. He came um, uh, in 1952, if you want to continue, uh, he was one of the editors of the papers for, uh, uh, and, and there's a series, and, and many of you who are probably more aware of the IL, ILWU, because the ILWU, let me mention, was one of the greatest allies of the Filipino community. Where we could not get collective bargaining rights, they came in and they helped to, allow, uh, to help us to unionize in the plantations in Hawaii and the Alaska Canaries. They came in. And so this is a yearbook that uh, Bulo signed, and it's very clear in his writing. I mean, this, the third page is all about Harry Bridges, right? It's very clear that this was a local that was very, uh, uh, very leftist. And, uh, and we'll see what the repercussions was. Okay, the, the next one, uh, third, third, third. And uh, uh, Ignion, I'll just say, like uh, Chris Monsalves, who was, who was president of the union, uh, they literally traveled thousands of miles, hundreds of miles, following that migrant stream, organizing up and down the West Coast, and basically lived in their cars many times, lived out of the Filipino community halls. Uh, I mean, they were just dedicated and selfless unionists. So, uh, Local 37 was one of the hardest hit, as we know. Uh, they had their, they had their, uh, their leadership murdered in cold blood. Uh, at the same time, Harry Bridges was being deported. Uh, they were also facing deportation on charges that they were close or not in, the, or you know, in the Communist Party. But they survived. They survived to become one of the most strongest uh, trade uh, trade unionists, uh, unionists in this country. And it's a proud history that we have. The Filipino community has. And unfortunately, like I said, it is kept from us for very good reason. So um, um, I put this I put this uh, photo in because as we see Larry E. Leon and Philip Veracruz, we really see who carried the, the, the role of leadership. Uh, it takes years years of training and years of experience to become a, you know, um, a unionist uh, of the caliber that he was. And um, so um, he unfortunately, uh, and, I, and I think when we look back, made some very bad concessions. 
and a very bad alliance uh, with, uh, with uh, the Chavez faction. The Chavez faction, and I'm going to remind folks again, like they told him, it's just a Hollywood film. I put forth that Chavez was really a creation. You know, if you met him, and I met him, I mean, I saw him uh, in our Filipino community hall, and I just didn't see him as a real leader. I did not. He'd sit at the table just droning on and on in Spanish, and I would say, uh, why is this man sitting in the middle of the, at the table when, you know, the Filipinos were just kind of pushed to the side, and he's just taking over the meeting, and he just goes on and on and on. I mean, he doesn't excite anybody, right? Why? And you come to realize uh, that he really was a creation of the corporate media, the Democratic Party, and the Kennedy family. Just like Jackie Kennedy created the myth of Camelot after her husband died, the Kennedys and the Democratic Party are, are clever, right? <laughs> Intelligent in creating these type of, uh, of heroes uh, to, put in, to put before working people. And that's exactly what they found in Chavez. They created this person, and unfortunately it went to his head. And that's ultimately how the union was destroyed. Uh, I'm going to, if anybody, and I really, really encourage everybody to read Frank Bardacki's book. And I'm going to read this because he gives, Ileon gave a clue, a very important clue as to what he saw being created before his eyes. And he, and he, was, and he was asked by the Fresno Bee, and he explains, he says, I don't have any trouble, any problem with uh, Cesar. As far as, I, as far as I'm concerned, I have the greatest admiration for him. I'm not quitting to make things harder for him. But he, they all added that he was unhappy with a group of intellectuals who formed a brain trust around Chavez. Who were these people? Well, they were not the left. They were the right in the left movement. This is the, I don't know if many of you know this, Solins, uh, Saul Alinsky School of Thought. Well, they don't think that unions should exist. <laughs> Not really. They believe and they came up with this whole concept of Com community organizing. Well, the, you know, the union is only for those who are working, but we build a community or a uh, organization and everybody. Okay, but they come in under that facade and that's the way they enter the UFW. They befriend the Chavez. And slowly but surely, they were the ones who surrounded him. And between the two, of course, between Ethiopia and Chavez, who do you think that Saul and the Olinsky people would choose? Of course they would choose Chavez. I mean, Ethiopia knew who they were all about. He'd been in the union long enough. I mean, he'd been in the labor movement long enough. But he says, all I can say is that the thinking of these people does not relate to the thinking of farm workers. And Brother Chavez is with them day in and day out. Instead of trying to understand the problems of the farm workers, Chavez is swayed by the grandiose thinking of these people who have created this monster organization on behalf of the farm workers. Monster organization. That's what Ibiom, that's the clue that gives, that Ibiom gives us to tell us we're not looking. You may see the physical attributes of a union, like a Frankenstein, right? But it doesn't have the inner workings of a union. It's a monster organization. What's the name of the book you're recommending? It's uh, Frank Bardacki's book, The Trampling of Vintage. What's it called? It's, it's a trampling of the vintage, uh, trampling out the vintage. But it, he. He basically documents how the Alinsky people came into the UFW, co-opted it from inside, using Chavez as the doorkeeper. Okay, Chavez opened the door, let them in, but they were behind. And I saw these people in the Filipino hall, and I didn't really know who they were, you know. I'd see them, and they'd be whispering in Chavez's ear, and I'm like, who are they? They never talked to us Filipinos. Who are these people? All these quiet people, they just come around, and you know, and I just came to figure, well, they're his hammers, you know? 
You tell them when to move and how to move and what to say and when not to talk. But that's exactly what these people are. And, and I mean, you don't, you don't need me to tell you who those people are, right? Yeah. Yeah, because many of them went on to very prestigious and very well-paid jobs in the labor movement, right? Top positions, right? So we know who those people were. They used the UFW as their training grounds. So that's, that's, you know, that's, you know, the thing about Philip Veracruz and Mary Leon, they never came out of record to say why they left the UFW. They never did. They, as they, in their time, this is what they considered to be principle. We had disagreements, but these will hold to ourselves. In some way, you feel it's unfortunate, but I think, like I said, in reading, their words, and in studying their actions, we understood what they saw develop before their eyes. Philip Veracruz, and if you know any, if you want to read a very interesting account of how Philip Veracruz was just basically forced out of the Union, read this book. It's by Miriam Powell. And they basically humiliated and drove Philip Veracruz out of the Union by, of course, accusing him as a leftist, uh, as a subversive, as plotting to overthrow Chavez. Really? <laughs> What's the title? This is Miriam uh, Pavel's book. She's a reporter for the LA Times. She was with the UFW. What's the name of the book? It's The Union of Their Dreams. Okay, of their dreams, or because, as, jo as Johnny very well pointed out, they were not union organizers. They do not know how to build a union. She, I just got to her in. But uh, anyway, um, so who was the who was the one that uh, uh, Chavez relied on to corner and pressure uh, Veracruz? Uh, pretty much the last you know, standing in the UFW to uh, you know, shove him out the door was Eliseo Medina. We know Eliseo Medina, right? No. Oh, we don't? No, a lot of us don't know this. Okay. We should take it for granted. Top ranking official with the SCIU. And what, what was his role in farm work again? Oh, he was uh, Chavez's, one of Chavez's, advi uh, you know, circle. You know, uh, one of his close friends, but, but close allies. But basically, he did his dirty work. Okay, and so in, this is really—it makes you sick to read what they, how they try to corner uh, uh, Veracruz, trying to force him to sign a letter, uh, and trying to confiscate all his paperwork. Yeah, pretty dirty, ugly stuff. And Eliseo was the one who, who uh, Chavez sicked on him. Uh, so read this book. Interesting how the inner workings of the UFW. Okay, so you by that time you begin to understand there was no rank and file democracy, not in the UFW. Chavez was top down. Chavez's faction top down. There was no union elections for leadership. There's not today. If you want to see the board and then take a picture of the board. None of those people are rank and file. But maybe five, ten years they're going to be. Union leaders and talk some of the big labor, uh, big unions in this country. That's where they get their training. But they're on the board making over a hundred thousand dollars a year on the board of the UFW. So um, here's another good book. This is Randy Shaw's book. Now, Randy, you know, is an attorney here. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, he uh, was a part of the team, the UFW legal team. And he has a very interesting part in his book. And uh, I encourage all of you to read it because on the back of the book, it's uh, called Beyond the Fields. In other words, just go to the fields and get your training. And then once you get your training, move on. And so Steve points this out to me, Steve, <laughs> that's up, sir. Uh, after the 80s, when basically a lot of folks had left, 
he talks about all those people who were once part of UFW and now they're in uh, some of the top law firms in San Francisco. They're on some, <laughs> I mean, this is incredible, incredible stuff on how the UFW was really, you know, union bureaucrats, right? How they got their training, how they used the union of the agriculture workers. And this is what Ilion began to see, this monster organization that was all for this, their self-interest. And uh, so pick up this book. <laughs> it's very interesting to, to, to listen to Chavez's own words. He's not the historic icon. In, in one section, Eliseo Medina is trying to tell him what a union is. Uh, excuse me, you're, you're the president of UFW. You need somebody like Eliseo Medina to tell you what the union is. And yet they go into this discussion prior to a convention where Medina is trying to get it clear to Chavez that no, it's not all about signing contracts and the like. It's about the workers' power. You have to talk about that, the workers' power. At this time, Chavez was very interested in playing what they call the game, the Synanon game, where everybody snitches and yells and everything. And, and yeah, it, well, Chavez was very much into that game, and he loved to play it, especially in La Paz. And that's, I'm gonna just tell you very quickly, and uh, that that is one reason Delano, in those days, was always a Filipino town. That was our, you know, in the Central Valley, that was our Filipino town. We would end the season there. We would start the season, like my family, we'd pick grapes, we were from Imperial Valley, go to Coachella Valley, start the season and pick the grapes, and then head north, working in the small towns of Arvin and Lamont and everything. But, you know, Delano was the big town, the big Filipino town, town community hall, you know, a lot of businesses, I mean, this was where we all kind of came, converged during the season and we got to meet, you know, Filipinos from all over. Uh, so that was the first step that Chavez had to make he, in order to begin to purge the Filipinos out. He had to get out, number one, out of our Filipino community hall. It was in our hall, claiming it as, as his hall. So. They moved him out, his, his, uh, his Olinsky people, moved him out, got into the hall. Then they went out to the boonies, right, uh, where they built uh, 40 acres. And then, you know, when it really got to his head, then he went to the mountain, right? Far away from the, yeah, far away from the rank and file, from the workers. And, and the, when uh, Caesar decided to do that, mm -hmm. uh, my father was his biggest critic of that move, because what does that do? That moves, first of all, he moved out of town, and how are these, these older uh, manoms? They don't drive, you know, they work, so they have to depend on bus rides to get to, to the location. So that limits the amount of contact that he has with the manom generation. So even then, as time went on, he moved up to La Paz up in the mountains where no one can see him. And I distinctly remember hearing my father being very, very super critical about that particular move. It was so far away, it was so hard for anybody to get up there and to deal with Thomas in any way. So basically he was, he was in his own private retreat and everything from any really seeing eyes that could, to, that could say anything about what he's doing and, and what he's plotting. I think that that was part of the creation of the of the myth. You know, uh, if if the workers could see him every day, Chavez every day walking in his office and talking about the problems, they would quickly realize this man does not have the qualifications to deal with the day to day organizing. They would quickly see that, and he had to remove himself, and he did that by moving away from the valley, the Central Valley, and up into the mountains. Frank Bardaki's book is, is out of print. You can probably get it to the library, but it's out of print. Um, a recent... Actually, we ordered 20 copies. You so have? Yes, we yeah. ordered. We it's ordered. not out of print. 
Yeah. yeah. You can get it on uh, and uh, Amazon or no, any not other place. Amazon. Or Marvel, Marvel, whatever. Marvel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can find it online. I'm trying to buy it over here. Buy it and oh. you'll get a good price through Johnny. <laughs> I'm trying to buy it across the street here at the, uh, the bookstore. Excuse me, we're selling the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At any rate, uh, a couple of points. Uh, back in the early 70s, I knew some people who were sort of sycophantic about Cesar Chavez and so forth, and they were going to go down to see him. And uh, I conned my way into the trip. So I had to go <laughs> pause to see, uh, to see Caesar. And I uh, uh, was not impressed, to be frank with you. I was okay with most of the First time I'd ever actually seen it, came away mostly very unimpressed. Uh, I wanted to say something about Larry and Leon. I knew all these very extraordinarily talented uh, <coughs> farm worker <coughs> uh, uh, leaders. And Larry stood out uh, for what you have mentioned, his organizational institute, what you mentioned is his talents and strategy. He actually stood out among them. That was what impressed me. Actually, I got to know him better than most of them, although Chris Monsalves and I were good friends. There's uh, something I just wanted to mention. During the, the uh, witch hunts, the McCarthy period, to give you a flavor of what it was like, a number of uh, activists in, in the Alaskaros got on a plane in uh, Seattle to fly to Alaska to go to their jobs. The U.S. government forced the plane down in Canada, took them into custody and arrested them and prepared to deport them. Uh, which, <clears throat> because they could possibly deport you at that time uh, if you were not in the U.S. They actually won the case and got back in the U.S., but that gives you a flavor of what it was like to be a Filipino, leftist, trade unionist, activist during that time. Wow. <clears throat> so I wanted to deal with one other aspect of the character of the UFW and so we can truly understand why agricultural workers today are in the sad shape they are. One of the things that, again, another clue that Nick Leon and actually Vera Cruz later talks about is how this group of people around Chavez would do everything for the farm workers. Farm workers didn't have to do anything. Nothing. Just show up, you know, for a big rally or something. They didn't have to do anything, right? Come out to a, you know, a demonstration of life. But as we know, in the in, in the late uh, 1930s, uh, when collect when um, when the rest of the country was finally able to win uh, collective bargaining rights, agricultural workers were excluded. At the very last minute, they were excluded. And what that did is that it pretty much knocked agricultural workers to their knees. It was a very hard blow, because that meant that your government that would not protect you in any way the courts, the agencies, the park department, no one would protect you. You were at the complete mercy of, of agribusiness. You could do, they could pay you what they wanted, they could work you 16 hours a day if they wanted. <coughs> when I first started working in the fields, and this was before 65, you know, one season we come in and we get paid 98 cents an hour. If we grumble, well, you know, we get paid by the piece. Uh, if they wanted you to uh, get to work at 4 o'clock, that's what time you showed up and you're not going to have a job, okay? If they told you that they wanted you to work till 5, 6, 7, uh, that's what you did. And, uh, you know, I just like, you know, growing up I thought, well, this can't be right. I mean, we don't have minimum wage. I mean, you know, kids at the, at the grocery store get minimum wage. We don't get, we don't even get that. So, so, I mean, agriculture, Agricultural workers were actually forced onto their knees, and the only ones who really, really uh, fought to get off their knees, you know, in, 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 concert, um, in concert with other agricultural workers who were the Filipinos. We were the vanguard for many, many years uh, to bring agricultural workers together and, and, and get collective bargaining rights. But so this is the interesting thing that I wanted to point out about the, uh, the Alinsky uh, School of Thought is that 
Carlos Bolasan, oh, in his writing, he's always talking about the need for workers to march. We need to march, we need to move, we need to keep pushing on. So if somebody is bringing you what you need, what's going to happen to your legs after a while? They're going to atrophy, right? Your muscles are going to grow weak and flabby, and you're not going to be able to stand up on your own. Well, that's exactly by design. And that's where they put uh, agricultural workers, uh, the UFW. Uh, that was their strategy to keep agricultural workers on their knees. So you can see that the membership from the time that AWOC, okay, the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, AFL-CIO, under the leadership of Ilion, when they first uh, launched the 1965 grape strike, and I mean, they were, a, you know, a fire star. Uh, and the membership went sky high. By the time Chavez, and his, Chavez's faction was done, uh, I mean, come on, uh, they hardly had, they didn't have a, they didn't have a major contract anymore. They didn't. They had very few, and the, and the ones that say in the union were basically those who kind of saw him more as, as a religious figure. <laughs> really? You know? They really did see him as a union uh, leader. Right? And uh, that is the problem when you have folks who, who say they're going to do it for you. You know, union bureaucrats say that, you know, just stay home, we'll do it for you. No, workers have to win their own victories, fight their own battles, so that they create the muscle and the strength and the stamina to win battle after battle. So I wanted to, uh, to point that out because that was one thing that Elio really saw. How these people say they're working on behalf of the farmers. Farmers don't have to fight for themselves. They're going to do everything on behalf of us. That was a real clue that Elio gave us. Right. So I just wanted to, to uh, show you. He has a question. Did you want the no, I just right I now? saw a picture of uh, former dictator <laughs> Marcos shaking right. hand with Chavez. I believe that was in 1977. I was a 24 year old banana organizer in the Philippines, and we were trying to get Cesar Chavez to to talk to us because we learned about the activism of the United Farm Workers in America. And, and he refused to meet with us while he was dining and whining with uh, Secretary uh, Blas F. Opley. I was just thinking, and I asked this question uh, to Miss uh, Dolores Puerta of what was he thinking and what was the, the thinking of the Filipino uh, leaders during that time when, when meeting with Marcos was to legitimize the dictatorship in, in, our, in my country, and there was a President Decree 823 that banned strike. We were banned to strike during the time of the martial regime. So well, how could this liberal leader in America come to the Philippines and legitimize the Marcos dictatorship when there was uh, uh, no, no strike uh, for the workers? And so I was just bringing that up because that really uh, bring me back to the time when when Cesar will refuse to meet with the leaders in my island in Mindanao to meet with us because we were plantation workers and we want to dialogue with him about the conditions here and our condition there, but he refused. So just bring me memories of that time. Um, could, you, could you tell us your name again? Uh, I'm Das Lampares. I am one of the organizers in the U.S. now. Okay. That's not there, but isn't there? You know, that's, that's funny to bring it up, and I, I put that on there for a reason, for that particular reason. Uh, here, um, just recently at the 40th anniversary of the Akbani village, which you were right, uh, that, that question was brought up, and then it was answered by Dolores uh, Horta, and she said that it was the Filipinos, uh, Andy Umatan, who was uh, uh, sympathetic to Marcos, uh, ah. that made that trip. Andy was the one who, who did the whole organizing of that trip, and uh, I believe even uh, to meet with, with Marcos. But, you know, not all Filipinos were sympathetic to, to Marcos. And, uh, of course, uh, <coughs> Philip was, definitely was not. And that's the reason why Philip did leave. So, well, I have another question. It's very important. But there's another, <clears throat> another figure that you always see in these pictures, 
a lot, it's trade union leader, Walter Ruther. What, um, I, Walter Ruther led an anti-communist campaign in the auto workers union. Um, and what kind of role did he play in the, um, in the farm workers union as far as, you know, bringing them into, into the union and bringing and promoting Chavez and what, what kind of, what kind of role was, was the influence of Marxism on your dad and, and other people like that, that actually were doing the organizing? Well, you know, um, that's a very, very hard question to answer. Big um, answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and the thing is... I'd like to comment on that. Okay. Um, Cesar Chavez was close to Walter Ruther. Walter Ruther was close to Bobby Kennedy. And that's how they made Caesar Chavez. Yeah, Over here. Johnny, I wanted to also say, um, I'm Juanita Tamayo Locke, and I wanted to tie what Josh said. Because when I saw that picture with Marcos, it reminded me, uh, most, most of you know I'm from San Francisco, but most of my work has been in Washington, D.C. And I was at one of the Smithsonian events where they talked about the farmers you know, farm movement, and so I'm waiting to, for them to talk about Filipinos. The person they had representing the Filipinos was Andy Iutan. And Andy, and this is what I'm getting from my colleagues in Alaska and Seattle about, you know, when Mary Jane says, you know, why, why did things fall apart? Well, you had mentioned the UFW part, but people forget the Marcos. You know, in the 70s, the 60s, the Mar uh, the, the Marcos, the Filipinos in the U.S. and in the Philippines were divided with Marcos. And what happened is when Andes is up there at the Smithsonian National American History Museum and telling everybody that he was the leader among the Filipinos and starts bad-mouthing people like your father and Philip, it's like, wait a minute, what's going on here? And people begin to connect the dots. Like, well, look what happened. To you know, to the to Domingo, to Silmi Domingo and Jean Viernes. What happened to those union guys? What happened to the guys up and down? As I told you, my my um, my uncle Pete was was one of the foremen in Watsonville. My uncle Arsenio in Porterville, up and down, and then they go up to Alaska, right? Because that was the route. But what happens is these guys, the Monons, our fathers and uncles, they had been trained. I mean, when you, Howard says these guys were militant, where did that militancy come from? It comes from the Philippines, because those guys were born at the cusp of the revolution from Spain. They knew Rizal. They knew KKK. They knew, they knew American colonization because they were being groomed for, you know, to be a liberated democracy in the Philippines, right? Manuel Quezon, all those and I guys. think also that people don't realize that after the Spanish War was the yeah. um, American and Filipino Right, War. the Filipinos fought against the Americans, the Americans, right? Because the Americans had sold them, the Spaniards had sold them to the Americans in the Treaty of Paris. And so this does not isolate, is my point. My point is it goes all the way back from the Philippines back to the U.S. And, and our government does not want to recognize this war, the mm. Philippine-American War, because First of all, it was the uh, most, uh, it was the war that had the most AWOL uh, people leaving the military because yeah. mainly it was the blacks, first of all, and then the whites followed afterwards because they saw exactly what happened to them happening in the Philippines. So they would just uh, quit and leave and, and just take off. And the Appalachians were Scotch Irish. Anyway, I'm going to point uh, you to this. This is um, this was a, a newspaper that came out. Uh, one of the organizations during the 70s and 80s of uh, leftist Filipinos, were communists, uh, was the KDP, the Katipuna. And and a lot of the folks that worked uh, that uh, were involved in that, you know, uh, were members of the KDP. But uh, in 1979, Marcos through the arrangement of Andy, uh, Andy Hinton, goes to the Philippines and basically embraces the, uh, Marcos. Now, you heard that Huerta gives this very 
were ever in the union, never approached to be in the union. And, um, but more importantly, when I asked Kevin, I mean, I was just sick. He's not in the union uh, picking grapes. He's not in the union anymore in Alaska. And that's what's happened to our agricultural sector. It has, and, and I think that the UFW played a big role in that, uh, helped to undermine the organizing uh, efforts that were made and basically leave it. So I just wanted to end in, in saying this, that agricultural workers actually live, I mean, really live on their needs. Uh, just basically going where they can find work and the like. And so I ask people, why is it important why is it important that we organize the agricultural sector? Okay. So I kind of end by saying that if, if any of you are about my age, okay, you grew up at a time when there was not cancer, when there was not diabetes, okay, when there was not obesity. We didn't have these bloated bodies, okay. Something happened at the same time that the UFW was attacked internally, internally, and the agricultural movement was undermined. Agribusiness was able to go in there, take total control of our food system, and make it toxic. In one of the photos that you have, very in the own, clearly understood that, and has a big banner that says, stop the pesticides. And that, and because agribusiness is able basically to smash us, right, it totally controls our food chain. And now we have the epidemic of diseases that we have. If we're going to turn around this food system, it doesn't start with us, the consumer. Come on, I know corporate media tells us. No, it starts with the workers in the fields, in the packages, in the processing plants. It starts with them. They see what agribusiness is doing. You know, those pictures that were, that were, uh, that were um, taken out uh, of the slaughterhouses in Kings County, okay? That was by a worker who was sickened by what he saw. We have to rely on workers. And it is only through their organizing that we can turn around our food system so that it is, you know, healthy and uh, natural again. And so, uh, you know, I remind people about that. If you're not going to support the workers who plant and pick and pack the food that we eat, then, you know, we're going to continue dying of the diseases of eating food that's not even food. It's manufactured, right? Monsanto. Right, Monsanto. Yeah. There's another interesting thing I wanted to point out. In 1971, does anyone remember what happened? 1971. The U.S. helped to engineer the coup of Salvador Allende. Today, a lot of our table grapes come from Chile. Now, agribusiness knew exactly what it was doing. They knew that the economy, the, the, the growing season of Chile duplicates. It's a mirror of California. It's a mirror. So during our winter season, there's summer. And they expanded their, their profit center. So now you see more and more vegetables and fruits and uh, coming uh, from Central and, of course, Latin America. And Chile was one of their prizes. That's why they had to get rid of Allende, because he was moving to national. <laughs> but uh, so um, when you go to the markets, you see a lot from Chile, and there's a reason. Uh, agribusiness, just like in white, is moving out. They get more money in real estate speculation and building resorts and uh, a lot of different things. Uh, solar farms are the big thing now for agribusiness. But, uh, so I just want, want to, to, to add that, that, you know, we do this recounting of history because it tells us we need to rebuild, rebuild the movement to organize agricultural workers. The agricultural sector, I mean, we can live with it without everything, right? We can live without clothes, without shelter, without cars, without electronics. We can live with all that. We can't live without food. And, and, and the 1% can move us and go back. If we, can, if we can gain control of our food production system, you know we have them on the run. And Kissinger, that's why. Kissinger says you control the food, you control the people. That's right. Yeah. And if you control their union. <laughs> All right. Have a great question. Mm -hmm. Who formed or who put together the group that 
was responsible for building the retirement center at Agbayani Village. Well, you know, that's, that's very interesting because according to the, the UOW, uh, Cedar Chavez and Laura Soldo, uh, actually, you know, let me, let me rephrase that, because that was before this 40th anniversary. At the 40th anniversary, Dolores sat right next to me and said, hey, let's give credit where credit is due. <laughs> I came up with the idea of Agbayani Village. <laughs> See, they began to believe in their own myth. Okay, as far as construction is concerned, the construction industry, I'm familiar with the construction industry, the building and construction trade union. Here's my uh, Aguayani Construction Company. That's a non-union company. So Aguayani was built by a non-union contractor. Yeah. Well, wow. and, and as after she spoke, and because that, that question was asked of her, or asked, and she she said that. And again, I'll say it. She said, "Let's give credit where credit's due." I thought of creating Bob Miami Village. I mean, it's good that the village was so, built. The yeah, retirement center yeah, was built. Yeah. But my problem is, is that it was built by a non-union contract. Yeah. And and the thing too is that uh, right before she said that, they 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 played Marissa Roy's uh, the documentary, uh, the the Lane Dogs. Pretty much a lot of a lot of it was about my father, and in that documentary, uh, I have the original document that shows the schematic that, that my father made, and part of that schematic was a it was a vision of creating a whole community uh, for the Filipino people, and part of that was creating a retirement village, and and it shows there uh, just like this on screen, and. Apparently she wasn't paying attention to the documentary. And in front of everybody, you know, she says that after the fact, and again I point out, as you saw in the documentary, the schematic that my father made, this was pre uh, AWOM. Before AWOM. And of course, you know, the, the beginning of, of it all of, of that whole uh, the creation of UFW uh, you know, was started from AWOM. And I also pointed that out too, because in the beginning of the event, you know, they said, you know, it was Dolores and Chavez, or Walter and Chavez, who, who created the UFW. And, and again, I pointed that out, that uh, AWOC started in 1958, and, uh, which was, you know, a few years, four years before NFWA was ever created, and, uh, and so on and so forth, because they say it, the UFW started as a dream from uh, Chavez starting NFWA. <coughs> The was actually it wasn't given. Um, organizing no, 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 before that, um, the it was in yeah the CSO yeah oh. yeah community service organization and you know they're, they're trying to say that he he thought of the UFW before then well he never thought of it before then because he was creating a a Mexican union and that's what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And what I always ask all of all the, the UFW uh, uh, younger, lower level leaders uh, is what's united about a, uh, a Mexican movement, the Chicano movement? What's united about that? Chicano movement. I always throw that question at them and they well, just actually get confused. Huh? Cesar Chavez was in the Navy when your father was organizing it. Agricultural workers. So, uh, but I, I um, oh, yes. yeah, question. Yeah, I just want to uh, clear up one thing. Maybe it's part of the distorted history, but I understand in, that in the, uh, the time that, that we're talking about here, before the UFW got formed, that the Mexican agricultural workers would oftentimes be used as strike breakers against the Filipino agricultural yes. workers. And the thing I wanted to get clear about is that uh, I understand that Cesar Chavez, before the UFW again, uh, was instrumental in getting the Mexican workers to honor the Filipino strike lines in, during the, in the Delano strike. Uh, at least I think that was it. And, uh, and that that was part of why the AWOC and the UFW eventually became part of the UFW. But that he, was, he stopped the strike breaking is what I been told so, 
Let's. Sid, Sid Bellador is not able to join us, I guess, but he, he knew firsthand what took place there. When AWOC, Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, they met in the Filipino Community Hall, and, you know, the decision was to strike September 8th. They walked out. And unfortunately, the Mexican workers had not been informed and were crossing our picket lines. So Ileon went to Chavez. First time, no, no, we're not ready, no, we're not going to strike. But Ileon, of course, is a very persistent man. He went back again and again. The next time he went was... He a total of four times. Yeah. With, with uh, Philip, with Pete, mm -hmm. and, and, and every time different. And uh, so four times. Straighten that out. Mm -hmm. Right. But actually, in, in the final, in, in the... Finally, it was not Chavez who made the decision. It was the workers in the National Farm Workers Association. They basically just overrid him, overruled him, and said, we're, we're not, you know, the Filipinos have gone on strike. We're going to go on strike, too. So Chavez was kind of dragged along. Mm -hmm. he, he never, so here's another distinction. The National Farm Workers Association was not a union. It was built in the Olinsky model, and that is this. That they were kind of, they were going to be like kind of a, a fraternal, a, a, a you know, a mutual, uh, what is that? Self help, a mutual aid society kind yeah. of organization. That that's what that that's about, and that's actually when you when in, in some of the interviews, I mean, you know, Chavez admits it. You know, they didn't really want to become a trade union. No, they just wanted a fraternal organization, you know, for Mexicans, and they would, you know, and. Um, so when they met up with, with Ileon, I mean, and, and the other Filipino uh, labor leaders, saying, you know, it's time. The time is right. Time to pick, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, he was actually dragged along, uh, but, you know, in the most uh, twisted way that history happens, he, became, he becomes the icon. And I think that our duty really is to correct uh, the way U.S. history has been written, and write it correctly, write it left, <laughs> right? Oh, okay, one more. Yeah. Uh, and, and as Mary Jane said, um, to correct history, and uh, let me tell you, this year has really, since 2010, was really a, a big, big difference in in uh, what what I've been trying to do. Uh, you know, to get our history out there, to get my father known. And this year, with, with the, it was really with the help of the Chavez movie, I, um, what, what do they call it, troll? I trolled the, the Chavez <laughs> uh, movie uh, Facebook, me, and I got a couple other people to do it, we trolled it, we kept on putting the, the true information, I kept on attaching uh, historic photos to it, so people, you know, you know, they may see it, but, you know, it had like a lot of hits, you know, um, 5,000, 8,000, 10,000, you know, up to 30,000 hits. So every single person who put their, you know, their comment on it, you know, um, uh, all these all these Mexican people and, you know, all kinds. And every time I'd throw it on there, it would pop up on their screen, of course, you know, that's the way Facebook works. So I kept on handing it over and over and over again with, with real historic photos. Uh, you know, if, if they didn't read what I was saying, they visually see it. And uh, so that that's, you know, because of the Chavez movie, and then following the, the, the Lane one albums, and then my picket of the Chavez movie um, made probably the biggest difference because uh, I get uh, or, uh, recognition from the Filipino uh, uh, media, uh, while now, finally, uh, my my son's, uh, my older son's, uh, his mom, um, she saw me on, I think it was KTLA. So now LA has really ignored me, which is, you know, kind of typical, you know. Um, of course, LA is more Hispanic and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but they don't realize that, that I am mestizo, I'm half Mexican, half Filipino. So, you know, they can't say that. Oh, you know, he's, he's, you know, for, he's for the brown side. Oh, wait a minute, I am for the brown side. <laughs> So, you know, anybody who tries to say anything, I mean, you know, I throw that back at them. How can I be racist? How can I be a separatist? Can't. So, um, they are. Yeah, exactly. They are. Exactly. 
So what had happened was, because of this, uh, because of the LA media, um, Al Jazeera actually picked up the story and put it out there, and it went worldwide. Good. And that's what mm -hmm. I think Juanita, Juanita, you had a question? Hi, um, we've been talking about the past, I mean, you know, we need to honor our ancestors and understand where we came from in a global world. But, you know, the agricultural workers today, not in the U.S., but also abroad, still divide and conquer. And, we, and when I speak to the younger generations, they feel like they can't win. And we know we won. We've won. We won in the civil rights movement. We stopped the war in Vietnam. We have to, to make our children, particularly because we continue to be an immigrant community, as well as four, five, six generations of Filipino Americans. And so my question to you is, where are the young people? Where are the people who are, we do have Asian American studies and Filipino American studies. We do have scholars. We do not have PhDs. What are they doing to connect? And also we have people who or, know how to organize right here in Silicon Valley. How are we tapping our intellectual capital for the 21st century? Well, I, uh, Johnny will speak to that in a minute. But I think that as we look around, and, you know, in, in a lot of our events, come on, we're growing older. And, you know, uh, Apo Indion would always tease me. He would say, you know, you're, you're our youngest organizer. You're going to organize the workers. And, you know, <laughs> and I think he realized who is the second line of leadership. And that's what confronts us here in this room. You know, when I was, when I was uh, uh, you know, a student, I mean, I came up here to I Hotel and I, you know, got radicalized with the, uh, with the other Filipinos and Asians here. Uh, we don't see that generation. We just don't see that generation. But again, it is going to happen. Their consciousness will awaken as we, and like I said, you know, you think of the Filipino labor leaders, decade after decade after decade, nonstop organizing, never giving up. And that's what we have to do till it ignites them, till they see that the time, you know, that um, they've got to join us on the front lines. Um, you know, I invited a lot of youth to this event. Uh, I know you try, everyone here tries to engage uh, the youth, but final analysis, it's, it's really going to be the workers. It's going to be the workers around their interests at the workplace that's going to bring about the change that's going to galvanize society. And the biggest alliances have always been between workers and students. But the workers are the ones that put things in motion. It's the workers. Students will come to support workers. But that's why we have to keep focus on organizing the workers. Any last comments? Uh, one more question yes. in the back right there, oh, sir. Uh, I, I came here to, to meet you, Johnny. Uh, that was by your dad's bedside before he died in San Francisco. And I'm a former pastor, retired pastor now, of Glide and a member of the church and professor. And my name is Tony Ubaldi. Tony, oh, okay. And, uh, okay. and I'm currently the uh, uh, president of the school board of Vallejo Unified School. I rise because I want to make sure we know who this gentleman is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great Fred Vasquez. Besides, besides your father, this guy has been my mentor when it comes to uh, labor organization. And I still relate to them because of you and because of that. Thank you. So I'd like, when you get a chance, I'd like to visit with you and share some of the experiences I've had with your father, and I was still young at that time now, <laughs> but he uh, saw something in me, I guess, but, uh, but he, he took time and invested in my, my growth. Thank you. Uh, look, look at this. Um, your name is right here on this piece of paper. Oh, this is Papa. What's that? 
this is this was a. Uh, after uh, Larry Ingham left the uh, UFW, he went on to uh, resurrect uh, this is, uh, his leg. The well, Philippine American Political Alliance, Papa. Um, that was to answer your question. Is we're Steve uh, Alvaro has really made a push to to reignite Papa and uh, Filipino American uh, Filipino uh, Association. Yes, um, and right here in front of me, I just pulled this out of my briefcase because I, I mentioned it earlier. It says the Anayin Pope for his people. Italino died in 1977 at age 63, but he continues to be an inspiration for those who follow his work. Filipino American leaders like Manuel Bersamen, Italian's voice, still rings through him in his daily work. Vice President of Watsonville, California, relates, even today, as I struggle with these feelings of inferiority that is a legacy of my father's experience in the farm workers. I hear Larry Kahn calling me to stand up with pride and fight for his for self-respect and self-esteem. Uvedi, Uvalde, who spent time with Larry before his death, remembers Italian's last words. He said, "Please unite our people." It was Larry's dream to see us work together. For common good, Sayyidullah, who is now a trustee of the Sonoma County Community College. Icons like, like Italy may pass, but his legacy should live on for the younger generation. Valor continued, uh, concluded, Italy was more than a labor leader and a civic leader. He was a great American. And, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm reading it and why I'm doing what I do and I fight so hard and I work so hard and I give up so much of my, my family's time and hours of work, uh, needed work that, that I need to pay bills and so on and so forth. It is right there. You just heard those three kids are the ones that will hopefully continue to work to bring our community together, our people together, and fight for everything that my father fought for. He stood up for those who couldn't stand. He spoke up for those who could not be heard. You know, that was my father. Johnny, One last question. Fred, you had one last thing? Yeah, well, I just want to follow up on Thanks, Tony, for that introduction. <laughs> Those of you that don't know me, I was born and raised here in San Francisco. In fact, this building is historic for me because my father had a business here on Kearney Street. But that's not what I want to point out. What I want to point out is for those of you who don't know me, I retired as the general president of the Iron Workers Union, no. Building and Construction no. Trade Union. In Washington, D.C. Wow. So let's. So we would like very much to thank Mary Jane Galvizo, Harold Howard. Howard, I'm sorry, Howard, Mary Jane Galvizo, and Johnny Young for taking time to come and share the stories at the I Hotel to unerase the erased stories and history.